Let's pray together. Lord, we pray that you would move among us tonight by your Spirit, enlighten our minds, give us wisdom as we hear your word, help us to understand and to do what it says. We ask for Christ's sake. Amen. Our scripture reading tonight is from the Gospel of John, chapter 21, verses 15 through 19, which can be found on page 990 of the Bibles in the pew in front of you. John chapter 21, verses 15 through 19. Listen to the word of the Lord. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. After this, he said to him, follow me. This is the word of the Lord. In the fourth century, after a time of relative peace, one of the Roman emperors named Diocletian issued an edict against the Christians This edict led to what came to be known in the history of the church as the Great Persecution. It was a trying time for Christians, for the church. For instance, Christians were forbidden to gather for worship. Churches were sought out, raised, and burned. Their assets seized. Copies of the scriptures were taken confiscated and burned. You might want to cover your ears for this next part. It's for mature audiences only, as they say. Some of the leaders had their tongues cut out. Others were executed. In a couple of particularly gruesome occurrences, it was reported that individuals were stripped, whipped, had salt and vinegar poured into their wounds and then were slowly boiled to death over an open flame. Pretty horrific. The intent was clear. Uh, The Roman Empire at this point in its history wanted to stamp Christianity out of existence. They wanted to eradicate it. They were tired of struggling with this nascent faith that they initially had seen as a sect of Judaism, but in time it had become clear it was something different than that. As we know, their attempt failed. And it wasn't all that many years later that Christianity became the official religion of the Roman Empire. Quite a story. But in the immediate aftermath of the great persecution, once Diocletian's edict was lifted, And the persecution ended and some of the property was restored and those things that had been taken, returned, restored. Um, 
a major controversy erupted in the history of the church. And here it is. How should the church respond to those who had saved their lives during the great persecution by denying their faith? How should the church respond to those who had saved their lives during persecution by turning over copies of the scripture, knowing that they would be burned? How should the church respond to those who had saved their lives by telling about the locations of other churches, by telling about people who claimed the Lordship of Christ and were subsequently rounded up and executed? in some cases tortured, how to respond to these folks. See, at the end of the persecution, people gathered together again to worship. And in the pews were family members who had lost loved ones. And those who had come back, lives intact, who had been spared because they had betrayed their faith and the church. This was a major controversy. Uh, there were those in the church who said, uh, the faith is about forgiveness, it's about grace. It's about understanding that no one is beyond redemption. Others uh, took a more rigorous position how could it be that after having been baptized, having made this commitment, that one would deny the faith of Christ in the, faith of death? in the face of death? After all, hadn't Jesus called us to follow his way? So what to do? What to do? And uh, if you followed the uh, discussions amongst Christians in the world today, you might have observed that Christians don't always agree with each other on these matters. Anybody not observe that? Uh, they often don't agree, and they didn't agree here in the fourth century. Some said we have to be gracious. Others said no, we have to be rigorous. We have to talk about holiness. And what to do? Well, uh, this led to a separation, and one of the prominent groups of Christians that led the rigorous holiness sect were known as the Donatists. And they said, look, you know, yes, there's plenty of forgiveness in Christ before you profess faith, but once you've professed faith, once you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit, once you've been baptized, if you fail then in a severe way, you're out. And we have the whole tradition of mortal sins. Certain things that you can do that mean you're cut off. And the other group said, no, grace obtains. Well, over the course of the next couple of hundred years, over time, the Donatists faded away. And the church unified around the idea that there's grace. And one of the key passages that they looked at to establish this idea that even in the face of the greatest failures, there was hope and forgiveness is this passage that we've just read this evening. The story about Peter. You remember the background earlier in John's Gospel. Peter was the one who claimed vigorously that he would follow Jesus to the end. Wherever Jesus was going, he would go. But he was not afraid that he would lay down even his life. He protested his devotion to the Lord. But then later, as we know famously, at the time of Jesus' execution, when there was a great deal of fear, fear might that happen to me if I'm a follower? Peter denied Jesus three times. Denied that he even knew him. 
And most scholars believe, as we now see in chapter 21, as we've been tracking this chapter, the disciples are back to fishing. They're fishing together. And most folks believe that Peter, being a leader amongst this group, when Jesus discovered them and then after, during the time of Jesus and afterwards, that Peter was the one who said, hey, let's go back to fishing. So Peter's denied the Lord and now returned to the old life. So it was hard for Peter now, seeing Jesus restored, returned, to be asked, not once, not twice, but three times, and Peter well knew the import of that, three times, do you love me? And three times, Peter affirms his love of the Lord. And interestingly, three times, Jesus' response is, then feed my sheep. Then feed my sheep. This threefold denial that Peter had articulated earlier is deemed by folks who read these texts to have not only been forgiven by Jesus in this engagement with Peter, but it's forgiveness that leads to leadership. Jesus is not only saying, yes, you're forgiven. He's saying, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Jesus not only forgives Peter, he commissions Peter again. And it's an important reminder that the flock which belongs to Jesus, the sheep that follow, the sheep that he's tending, and the leaders consists not of the righteous, not of people who do everything right and never make a mistake, but of sinners called to repentance again and again and again, even in the face of the most heinous betrayals. I mean, Peter didn't get 30 pieces of silver, but it's a betrayal, a denial. And here he's restored. Now, here's what's particularly interesting about this text, and I think that intensifies it in John's telling of the story, and that's its location in the context, the larger context of the gospel. It comes in the last chapter, chapter 21. This is a chapter that many scholars believe must have been added after the original conclusion, what they take to be the original conclusion at the end of chapter 20. So the last verse of chapter 20 reads as follows. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which were not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. Boy, what a great ending. That sounds like a wrap-up. It sounds like a summation. But then we have chapter 21, which gives us another account of the commissioning of the disciples who had been sent into the world on the day of Jesus' resurrection. And that's what's so interesting here. So this whole incident in chapter 21 comes later. It's not the day of resurrection. It's after that. Now, we remember... Uh, as we've been tracking out this story on Easter Sunday, the first Easter Sunday, Jesus appeared to the disciples. We assume Peter was in the midst. Everyone seems to have been there but Thomas. And Jesus gives them this incredible commission that we've looked at. As the Father sent me, so I'm sending you. Jesus is commissioning these followers to go out and carry on his mission in the world. And remember that that mission is so closely connected, the mission of the disciples to what Jesus has been doing, that they are given the power to forgive sins. And they're given the Holy Spirit. We're told Jesus breathes on them and they receive the Holy Spirit. Now I'd love to know what happened between then and this story that we have narrated in chapter 21 because it's clearly later 
and yet the disciples are out fishing. Peter's wandered off. You ask yourself, you think, boy, if, if we had seen that, if I had seen that, the risen Lord, that whole, what, what would I have, how would I have responded? And yet we're reminded in, in this narration that the way is long. And in the face of the most incredible things that we've seen, the proof that we so often look for, we find that, as a friend of mine said, proof rolls off us like water off a duck's back. The amazing things that lead us to commit ourselves to the way of Jesus fade in time. And many suspect that this chapter has been added to the original Gospel of John precisely to tell this story, particularly this story about Peter, who had denied the Lord, now received this commission, and in a sense, looks like he might be at it again. So Jesus comes again and restores Peter, not just forgives him, but gives him leadership. The early church looked at this text and concluded that on the basis of the example of the Lord, even those who had betrayed him directly, pointedly, specifically, could be restored. Not only restored, but emerge into a place of leadership. The question isn't about the past, it's the future. What will you do from this point forward? And Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. Don't wallow in the self-pity. Get on with the work. And we're told in an interesting sidelight here that um, Jesus says your hand's going to be stretched out, you're going to be taken where you don't want to go, and this is an indication of the kind of death that Peter would die. Yeah, this John's Gospel is written well after the time of Jesus and certainly after the death of Peter, which Christian tradition tells us that he himself followed Jesus to crucifixion in Rome. And according to a tradition that you might have heard, when Peter realized that he was going to be crucified, he said, if you're going to crucify me, do it upside down, because I'm not worthy to die the way my Lord died. And the story is that Peter was crucified upside down, and that this is an allusion to that kind of death. But the end of this is Jesus' simple words to Peter. Follow me. The past is the past. But where will I go now? Well, Jesus says, follow me. Feed my sheep and follow me. In the Gospel of John, uh, and we have to understand this to pick up the significance here, this idea that's central to the mission of Jesus is the bestowing of the phrase John uses 17 times, more than any other text in the New Testament, of eternal life. And oftentimes in the Christian tradition, we've interpreted that particularly to be about the life to come after death. But it's pretty clear in John's Gospel and in the writings of the New Testament that that language of eternal life is not primarily focused on a life that we'll have after we die, but it should probably be translated the life of the age to come with the age to come being understood not as some ethereal world that we call heaven, although certainly there's a belief in that, but what Jesus is calling for is a new world here and now. To have life, to have eternal life, is to have a, a quality of life, a quality of life that is about the business of bringing about this new world. That's what Jesus has sent the disciples to accomplish. As the Father sent me, sent me, so I send you. And 
we express our commitment to that life, our faith in that life, our confidence in that life, by doing what John says he's writing about at the end of verse 20, believing. Believing. But how do we believe? How do we express that belief? Is it an abstract idea, something in our head? No. In the New Testament and in John's Gospel and in the words of Jesus here, we express that belief by following. By following the way of Jesus. No matter what comes. No matter how much we've failed in the past. No matter how much we may think we're not worthy. Jesus' instruction is amazingly and wonderfully simple. Follow me. Have you betrayed me? Follow me. Have you failed miserably in life? Follow me. That's the way to life. Follow me. C.S. Lewis commenting on this challenge in one of my favorite passages, great English writer, author of Mere Christianity, uh, has talked about this kind of idea, this wrestling. He says this, I know all about the despair of overcoming chronic temptations, the things that trip you up again and again and again and again. It is not serious, he said, he says, provided that self-offended petulance, annoyance at breaking records, impatience, etc., don't get the upper hand. No amount of falls will really undo us if we keep on picking ourselves up each time. We shall, of course, be very muddy and tattered children by the time we reach home. But the bathrooms are all ready. The towels are put out and clean clothes are in the airing cupboard. The only really fatal thing is to lose one's temper, one's hope, and to give up. It is when we notice the dirt that God is most present in us. It is the very sign of his presence. Keep getting up. Keep following. Keep doing the work. That's where life is. Do you feel that you're not worthy? That the things that have happened in your life disqualify you for such great work? Follow Jesus. Do you have people in your life telling you, you're not doing it right? Follow Jesus. You notice in the Gospels, Jesus never goes, he tells people to follow. He never then goes down the line and says, you're not doing it right, get out of line. You're not doing it right. He says, follow. Keep following. I'm going over here, follow me. Are you afraid? Follow him. Are you lost and don't know what to do? Follow him. That's the message, the powerful message at the end of this text. The message that won the day in that early church conflict and continues to be a central message of our faith in the face of so many communities that want to talk about a rigor or a holiness that says once you've tripped up, if it's bad enough, you're out. Jesus says, follow me. Pick yourself up again and again and follow me. And as you do that to the end, all will be well. Amen.